In Civ 6, the early game gets more attention than attractive women on TikTok, as the other areas of the game are completely ignored, and Civilization 6 guides for the late game especially are lacking more than stability is in Syria. But today, I have 5 mistakes even worse than myself for Civilization 6 that will let you either secure a win in the late game or make a comeback greater than the American War of Independence. These 5 mistakes, if fixed, will make the late game faster and easier than strolling through Belgium in the 20th century. Like and subscribe if you do enjoy to not miss out on future content and let me know your thoughts down below in the comments. The first tip is the modern Russian strategy where you make some tactical late game wars and try not to bring the ire of a strongly worded letter from the United Nations. In every victory type there are some things that may require more effective diplomacy no matter the route you decide to take. Domination victory is obvious but taking out the number one culture makes culture victories easier as well as taking out someone who's about to launch into space gives you more time to get a science victory, and taking someone out with more Diplo favor than politicians have in corruption money will make Diplo resolutions in the late game a lot easier. The problem with the late game war, however, is the fact that you'll in all likelihood start an emergency, first to defend the nation through money, and then for a potential reconquest against you. And unless your army is large and can heal faster than the Dothraki in Game of Thrones, you're going to be in a dangerous situation. So the biggest thing I recommend recommend is to not wipe out the nation you need until you know whether you can win or not. For example, right before the last Diplo resolution, wiping out the Civ who has the most Diplo points will make that easier. Or after you pass the number two culture Civ and there's only one Civ remaining until you get a culture victory, that's when you take out the number one culture Civ and you'd win the game almost immediately. Timing these wars perfectly will let you steal that victory faster than my eardrums exploded after hearing a verse from the Island Boys. I recommend planes and modern armor as they are the most unstoppable combination since Vietnamese and jungles or Afghans and mountains. The AI will rarely have planes of their own, although two fighters should be enough to screen for your bombers. Getting oil might be the harder thing to do, but you can always trade for those resources and then take it off the AI's body by taking their oil-rich cities after putting them on a shirt. At the end of the day, you will also get more yields from captured cities, which might not help too much that late into the game, but getting a capital city, which is usually the strongest city by far, will give you another potential spaceport location or multiple wonders and great work slots to speed up your culture victory. And again, for a diplomatic victory, be careful, as taking enemy capitals reduces your diplo favor faster than the CCP reduces your social credit score after mentioning Tiananmen Square. The second strategy is the Almighty Holy Site, the most secretive OP district that is so underrated and strong. I'm expecting a spiffing Brit video any day. Holy sites help you in every victory type. Pagodas give Diplo favor per city, which can be upwards of 15 to 20, depending on how many cities you have. That might not seem like a lot at first, but in most games, you're not going to be making more than 10 to 15 Diplo favor unless you go monarchy. So getting that from just these buildings is a giant amount. For domination, you can deuce vault everyone, especially as Byzantium, with the 10 combat strength from Crusade. It is so broken that you would think Battlefield's next game already launched. But not only that, with the Grandmaster's Chapel, you can now buy units with faith, and while you can't magically make planes appear from the sky, you can make an imaginary army into reality if you just believe hard enough like YouTube motivational speakers tell you to do. With more faith than you know what to do with, you will easily be able to build multiple armies where you can send them out to different places to conquer the world, with culture getting a 25% bonus for following your religion is great, but think of the other possibilities. World churches, cathedrals, national parks, rock bands, getting people to wear your yoga pants and listen to your country music has never been easier. In all seriousness, late game culture is all about faith with, as without any late game tourism buffs, you're going to be sitting there waiting longer than it's taking Civilization 7 to come out. Finally, with science, cross-culture dialogue and Watts are super strong buildings that can amplify your early game science numbers faster than you guys amplified my subscriber numbers. And with strong enough faith, you can again go down Grandmaster's Chapel, take out your nearest neighbors to get more yields and science. All of this is to say that holy sites and religion slash faith are so versatile that any victory can make use of it, like the US Army makes use of high school dropouts. With a lot of time getting a religion, it might be a little
little too time consuming or too risky, but really all you need is some faith and a lot of the time this will help you achieve any victory type. Except score. We treat score like the last airbender movie. Almost everyone will tell you that building wonders on higher difficulties is a bad idea. Sometimes the bonuses aren't worth the effort, like when trying to explain why the earth is around to a flat earther, or sometimes the wonder is so highly contested, like the great shower, that you really are better off not risking him in the first place. However, these wonders come late in the game, where you are now probably farther ahead than most AI, but they also require specific planning, so unless the AI has Bob the Builder on the job, you have a great chance at securing these wonders that provide astounding bonuses and aren't just two science, a great work slot, and a subway cookie. The first wonder is the Statue of Liberty. Four Diplo victory points are 20% of what you need for a diplomatic victory, but the benefits aren't as good as the strategy. Like playing 21 in basketball at the nearest LA Fitness, when you get within range of winning, everyone starts ganging up on you to make sure that you don't end up winning. It's reasonable to get 15 to 16 Diplo for points before the AI starts ganging up on you, like Twitter gangs up on people with an opinion. The best way to counter this is to get the 16 points strategically. So for example, after the first session, you might have 14 points, and then the next session, try to get as many as you can, which will in all likelihood be 16 or 17, and then you'd be able to use Statue of Liberty to get the remaining four points you need, which will give you that sweet Diplo victory without having to go through the stress as the negative two Diplo points is more of a formality than a subpar Call of Duty game every year. The second wonder is the Roar Valley, which I know everyone already loves and knows and has wet dreams about, but it has to be said that this wonder is the difference between an easy win or an excruciating loss in the late game, especially when it comes to science victories, considering how expensive it is to produce everything in a science victory. Getting Roar Valley essentially secures you a win as you'll get more production than the ancient Egyptian food production on the night. The last wonder is actually split between two wonders, kind of like Cat Dog, Eiffel Redentor. Now, the Eiffel Tower gives all tiles in your empire plus two appeal, which is great for culture as you can get more national parks, more yields from preserves, and more things like seaside resorts as they require appeal on coastal tiles to be placed. Christ your Redentor, meanwhile, gives full relic and religious tourism bonuses after neglecting Enlightenment's effects on it, but also double tourism from seaside resorts. You know where I'm going with this. Apparently, nothing is better for tourists than a tea-posing monument to watch them swim on crowded beaches with overpriced frozen beverages. Apparently, as long as Redentor himself is watching you sunbathe, people are just going to keep coming back year after year. With these two wonders, you can spam out seaside resorts everywhere and have them provide insane amounts of tourism. The extra tourism from religious artifacts are great from Redentor, especially if you're the or you went void singers, which you should do in a culture victory anyway. With this strategy, you can skyrocket your already high tourism and secure a culture victory if you have the production to build and complete both wonders. And make sure to put Redentor on a hill so that he can be extra watchful of the tourists on the beach. They seem to love it for some reason. In order to get Khrushchev to Ligma Balls and win a science victory especially, or even a domination victory, you need to pump up your culture game and stop ignoring the late game civics. There are multiple civics, especially, that are key depending on your chosen victory type, including nationalism, which is all good things and won't come back to bite you in the ass by leading to a series of complex alliances, which leads to the most destructive war ever seen. But in all honesty, armies are some of the strongest units in the entire game, combining three individual units or a core, like a Dragon Ball Z fusioning, into one unit that will give you a super-powered army that can withstand and destroy almost everything in its path. The way combat works in Civilization VI is that the difference in combat strength is based on the difference in numbers, not a percentage. So a difference from 60 to 70 combat strength is the exact same as a difference between 20 and 30 combat strength and can be absolutely massive in this game, as it would take multiple 60 combat strength units to eliminate a 70 combat strength unit. With armies, you can 
also sustain more troops as armies are pound for pound less expensive than three of the same unit type and split them based on their promotions before combining them into armies and thus combining their promotions which will give those units all the promotions on both sides of the tree while still being able to get the level 4 super promotion in the same amount of time. For science, globalization is one of the best civics ever, possibly the best, with e-commerce letting your lazy ass stay at home and shop while simultaneously killing American style shopping malls. You will get more gold and production from trade routes as the entrepreneurs will try to capitalize on this trend like the greedy mother, I mean truckers, mother truckers they are. With all these trade routes giving you infinite supplies of gold and large production, you can supersize a city like a McDonald's heart attack meal and spam out these spaceports faster than you can say Ligma Balls Cruise Chat. The final Civic is Space Race. 15% production in a city with 200 is 30 extra production, which is 300 production over 10 turns. You get this with the Space Race policy card, provided you have encampments in your cities when building the spaceship parts. The only policy card that gives you a boost to space projects, this will let you start your own space force and launch yourselves into another planet first, like you're in civilization beyond Earth. This production boost to space technology should have you salivating more than Elon Musk as like him you'll be able to be the probably first organization to set up a colony in Mars. The final mistake is not planning out your industrial zones properly. We all know what industrial zones give us, production. With factories and coal power plants, you can spread your production to all nearby cities, like how pickup artists spread future sex offenders. This will give you the production needed in all your cities within six tiles, instead of having to build factories in each one. And this production can be used to build wonders, space parts, units, Statue of Liberty, faster than people lose their life savings betting on the Vikings. With this in mind, you can then position your strongest city, usually your capital, to where Magnus can use vertical integration to increase your power levels to over 9,000. You need to plan for this though, as if you don't place the pins early on in the game, you might get to a stage in the late game where the Ruhr Valley is impossible or where you messed up industrial zone placements, as all cities really have to be snuggled up together, like how Hannibal had the Romans snuggled up in the Battle of Cannae. And this does require you to plan out all the industrial zones around your capital with the Ruhr Valley, as imagine how much production you can get when you take all the nearby industrial zones, your capital's production, and multiply all of that by 20%. Not planning really leaves production on the table, which can cut down your victory time by a lot, and can be the difference between a sub-200 challenge victory if you're a sweat like me, or a regular win if you're just trying to survive against the AI's relentless onslaught like a Doom main character. We are very close to 20,000 subscribers, and I cannot thank you guys enough for all the support I've gotten over the last year. If you do enjoy, leave a like and subscribe to not miss out on future content and let me know down below which tips I might have forgotten and which ones I'm completely wrong in. I'll see you all in the next video. Peace.